What's up fellow car enthusiasts? Welcome to an episode of Behind the Boost presented by MA Performance. I'm your host, Charlie Main, and today we plan to bring you some of the behind the scenes of the automotive world. Uh, so what you were asking was uh, if I if I knew what I wanted to get into and picked up the camera and it was kind of it was kind of a hobby that I used to be in the car stereo competitions, like SPL competitions. I had my very first car I bought for my dad was a 95 Plymouth Neon. Okay. And had, uh, at the height of the craziness, I had a 25 cubic foot box in the back as a wall right behind my head of six 15 inch subs with 10 batteries in the trunk and uh, five amplifiers. And so that was, I, I did that for like three or four years when I was in college, traveling around doing DB drag racing and USAC. And then I got into sound quality stuff with that car. And uh, somewhere like two, 2001 timeframe, um, I was working at uh, one of the stereo shops in Omaha. And we went, one of the guys took me to my first street race. And this was shortly after the first Fast and the Furious. So everybody that liked fast cars was trying to, you know, be in the Fast and the Furious type of racing. But we showed up at a parking lot here in Omaha um, anyone, if anybody's on from Omaha is 144th and center, uh, it was a bag and save back then. And we, there was probably three or 400 cars in the parking lot and the police helicopter came, it was spotlighting us and like six cruisers rolled in from different directions. It was like literally out of fast and the furious. So <laughs> that was what got me hooked on street racing. Yeah, uh, after that, it was game over. Yeah, and I was already taking pictures and videos from the stereo competitions, and I would put the photos and the videos on a CD, and then I would sell those from the previous event at the next event that I would go to to help pay for gas and hotels and alcohol and stuff like that, just so I could yeah. go to stereo competitions. So when I got into street racing, it was all in Omaha for the first couple of years, so I didn't really need to travel much. But I started um, after a couple of years. One of my friends t talked me into to making a DVD, but I didn't know how to do it. So actually um, one of my friends hit me up from uh, high school back in Lincoln and he used to own a very large network of adult entertainment websites <laughs> and had a, a very large um, inventory of DVDs that they had made online. And like, so he knew the process of authoring DVDs and sure. doing all that. So I sent him all my footage to, author it together, make a DVD and, and replicate it. And that's how I did my first two DVDs. So it was uh, a little interesting. On the second one, actually, this is, isn't something I've told very often, but uh, the second DVD we had, once again, through my friend who did adult videos, the replication house that was copying them, they used the screensaver that they use on all of his movies. <laughs> for my movie <laughs> so if anybody out there happens to have a one of the first like two or three hundred copies of volume two street racing if you have a sony or pioneer dvd player if you hit pause you'll see what we like to call the 20-foot beaver oh, because, <laughs> because uh during the the premiere that i had with like 200 of my closest friends my parents my aunt and uncle um oh, there was a Sony DVD player there and the DVD was having issues. So I paused it and on this 20 foot screen was the screensaver. Of course. And so, like first, and family are the ones who get the first like runoff. So yeah, it's like, well, a lot of people didn't see it because I, I like I saw it and I, I hit power real quick or something, but um, I told my parents about seven or eight years later and they're like, huh? <laughs> like, I can't believe you didn't see that. Yeah. But anyway, that's, I didn't. I didn't know I liked street racing. When I first started taking pictures and videos, but uh, that's kind of how it progressed into it. And then I, um, as I started filming more and more, I was trying to find more and more ways to share what I filmed with the world. And back in two thousand three, two thousand four, it was just message boards. So like you had the PHP BB and the UB. What there's like different formats. So LS One Tech, SVT Performance. Um, I don't know, Omaha racing was our local board or any street scene, but I literally had a list of, um, in like a notepad on my computer, I had a list of links to different like 
video and photo sections on message boards for about 20 to 30 message boards that I would go in and copy and paste like my embed code or links to the videos. That's how I like tried to force things to be viral um, back in the day. <laughs> I don't know because like if you're just starting out and you're somebody trying to just get views on a video, I mean, that's a great way to get some exposure still. Yeah, guerrilla marketing. Uh, yeah, exactly. You just go in and you post it up wherever they'll let you. No, it's uh, the the crazy part is how many like enthusiasts don't understand like how much work you have to go into just like posting something like. Oh man! Even, even like as a sales rep here back in the day when we ran all the forum stuff, like we would have to format our own posts. We'd have to make sure that the embed link from wherever we were hosting the video was correct in there. You'd have to preview it about thirty seven times. And like then post it and then check it every couple hours to make sure you were answering people's questions. Now like yep. they can do all of it with two clicks and they're like complaining that they don't have enough time to do it. And I'm like, come on guys, like this is Yeah. Yeah. As a company you're paying like five hundred or a thousand dollars a month to sponsor a yep. section and then you have to have employees go in and post and do all that. Yeah, but it's funny how you mentioned that uh, you started more into like the car audio side and it developed yep. into something completely different. And I think that's the same for a lot of people, you know, when I, before I could even, I mean, for, to, to date myself, I guess I'm much younger than a lot of people, but, uh, when fast and furious came out, I was like nine years old. So I couldn't even yeah. go like see the movie by myself. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, and like, I'll never forget when I got the DVDs, like we went back and like me and my friends, we went and started drag racing our bikes. Uh, oh. but like, that's just what we did when it came out because like, that's all we could drive. But then, I mean, it very quickly, you know, we, it was maybe only a few years later till some of my friends started actually just buying cars, even though they couldn't drive and we'd work on cars in garages. And, you know, it was like, we'd get old busted up Toyota Camrys for like a hundred bucks and fix them up. And, you know, that was what we started our, you know, learner cars on or whatever, when we were like 15 and, um, you know, as soon as we could drive, that was the thing. Um, but yeah, no, it's just it's just funny how uh, the passion for the industry usually starts out a little bit different than what it develops into. Oh yeah, for sure. And I, speaking of ages, I, I love it when fans come up to me and tell me that like they used to watch my videos when they were uh, like growing up with their parents when they were like six or seven, and then I'm like, holy crap, and they're standing there with some built race car that's running nine second, eight second quarter miles. I'm like, wow, I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, in, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of people who got those DVDs early on that were younger, I mean, that had to be what inspired them to get into it. Yeah. I, I love hearing that. I love hearing that we've influenced people in one way or another to become a racer or have their own YouTube channel or anything in the industry, start, start their own shop or brand or something like that. It's, mm -hmm. Pretty awesome. Did uh did you guys do much on Street Fire back in the day? Oh yeah, I miss I miss Street Fire. Agreed. That was great. That was like that was basically YouTube before YouTube. Like they both yep. started about the same time, but Street Fire was like the car racing hundred uh, percent video platform. It's like I'm I'm not a huge person like on the YouTube side of stuff. Like I don't really watch it, but I mean I remember vividly like hours upon hours on Street Fire of just like next next next. All right, yep. I'm gonna watch every. I'm gonna like memorize these videos. And they actually got bought by a car domain back in like 12, 13, 14 years ago. Yep. The the big thing was there was like a message board on there that people would look for the certain types of videos or the certain like publishers. That yep. they could interact with on the message board, and so I would post every time I'd have a video in the, like the street racing message board section. Yep. When Car Domain bought it, they got rid of the message board because it was too much of a pain in the ass. Yeah, because it was uh, uh, like message boards are just notorious for hackers targeting them yep. and stealing passwords or taking them over or whatever. So they just got rid of it. But that was like. That was the reason why it was fun. You cut off the communication, the one-on-one -on -one with the, the publishers and the, it's kind of like having a Facebook group for a YouTube channel. It's kind of like the same thing. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. I kind of remember that whole ordeal happening and just like, it just kind of disappearing almost overnight. It felt like yeah. it from being something that I checked every day to, I, I honestly couldn't tell you the last time that I even attempted to search for it. Like it just yeah. was gone. 
when I worked for PayPal a long time ago, I was at a developer conference and there was someone there from car domain and he was asking me about street fire. And I'm like, Oh boy, do you really want me to tell you how I feel? What happened? <laughs> so we were, we were talking earlier about kind of how you got started with 1320 and um, you know, all of that, but what about like started for yourself, like in, in like the racing industry? I mean, how about, you know, like your cars that you started out with, what that developed into and kind of where you're at right now. So I've always just kind of been an enthusiast and a, a fanboy of the racers, to be honest. And mm -hmm. I really didn't like, I had cars that I liked driving. I had semi fast cars. I bought like, I had my neon. I, I got rid of that. When I first got getting into like fast cars, I bought a 1989 super coupe Thunderbird biggest pile of crap I've ever purchased. I, <laughs> went out street racing with it the first day I bought it. And like, I think it was that night I s spun a bearing in it. And then the next like eight, 10 months or whatever were spent, re spent dumping like six grand into a $2,000 car. So I sold it right after it was running. And then I yeah. got a 2000 Mustang GT and I turboed that. It was called the Boostang. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't a very serious car. I had like 450 horsepower and ran mid tens because I couldn't drive worth the crap. Sure. Uh, and then I bought a 99 Corvette after that, or no, ran mid 11s. I'm sorry. I then bought a 99 Corvette after that. And that actually ran the same times bone stock that my turbo Mustang did just because it was so much better car yeah. than a old crappy Mustang. It wasn't very old back then, but, um, and then from there, and that's kind of where the unicorn C5 came from was I had that 99 Corvette, and I always wanted a Speedway white Z06 because the 99 was just a base model FRC. Um, so I bought that, the Unicorn, like four or five years ago. And that was my first serious race car. I had a couple other Corvettes in between there. Uh, I still have my ZR1 I've had for like six or seven years. And that's my favorite car, the, the 2010 ZR1 C6. It's like, it's the perfect car. It has 800 horsepower to the wheels. I can beat on it, put it in the garage, take it out the next day, beat on it some more. You know, three months later, change the oil, put some new tires on it, and repeat. I love that car. The Unicorn is just like, I'm not a mechanic, and the Unicorn is borderline streetcar, but it needs a lot of attention, and you really need to understand the mechanics of what's going on to treat it properly, to make it work on the track and live. So it's not the ideal car for me, but I've had a lot of fun with that car. It's like, 1200 horsepower right now. Um, still stick shift, and I, I love that it's a stick shift, but it's yeah. just not as readable as I was hoping it would be. It's more of a track car. So I've I've been having a lot of fun with my ZR1 lately. Yeah, I'm a customer. I'm a I like to beat on my cars. I'm not a mechanic, so shops love me because I break stuff and just drop it off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any interest in working on them or, or the time usually. Glenn was asking, when is 1320 coming to Power Cruise? Do you know what Power Cruise is? Of course I know what Power okay. Cruise is. Right. Uh, I was actually at the Sydney Power Cruise two months ago, and we're going to have a lot of videos from that. We've got a backlog of videos. I literally came back from Power or I went from Power Cruise to a half-mile race in Perth on the other side of the country and then flew back. Like literally the day that they started running out of toilet paper is when I flew out of Australia. Oh. And so I came back, and three days later we headed down to Houston for TX2K. So we're – finishing up our TX2K videos, and then we're also finishing up the, the half mile videos. And then we got a whole bunch of Power Cruise videos from Sydney. That was an amazing event. But I know he's asking about um, Up in Brainerd, which has yeah. been on my list for a long time. Um, but my friend Gup seems to think that he owns the date, which I think technically he may have had his event the first weekend in August, one year ahead of me. I don't know, but it's my country, so. Uh, <laughs> We have our ice cream cruise event first weekend in August every year, and it is yeah. once again this year. So when we don't have the overlap, whenever one of us moves the date, I'll definitely be up there because I really want to come. I want to take one of my cars up to Brainerd for Power Cruise. I I got I love the event after seeing it in um, in Sydney. I'd love to come do it in Brainerd. So yeah, soon hopefully. Yeah, no, it seems uh, like up in Brainerd, that's a, it's a really big event up there. Um, I know a lot of my friends around here just like constantly talk about power crews and 
getting things ready for power crews. It's just mm -hmm. like highlight up here. My understanding um, is uh, the Brainerd events more like roll racing, right? People like to yeah. pair up and race. They don't do a lot of skids on the actual cruise circuit, right? To my understanding. Yeah. There's yeah. some drifting, but like in Sydney, it's literally a freaking war zone. Like some of these cruise sessions have 200, I don't, they might cap it at like 150, 200 cars, but it's like sometimes there's a traffic jam in some of the corners, like 50 cars just waiting to go around and people are just skating up the hill left and right. But it's like the whole track is just a cloud of smoke at, during like middle of Saturday. It was a, a very unique experience, that's for sure. I don't know what car I would want to bring. I would never want, I wouldn't want to bring any of my cars, my nice Corvettes to Sydney. Like literally the whole track is covered in tire, like we, or tire cords and chunks of rubber. And, but I, I hear Brainerd's a little more friendly to paint. <laughs> yeah. It, it has its moments. You definitely like pick out what cars you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to try to stay on the opposite side of this guy. Like, yeah. It, Some it, of the amateur it, drifters show up. Yeah. You, you find you, you find your groups that you kind of hang out with and uh, decide if you want to be like the tail end of one so that you're not in the <laughs> middle of everybody. Well, I thought it would be a pretty good time to jump into some of our more unique questions that we got for you. Um, right. So we posted up on our Instagram story, uh, just asking for some feedback from some of our followers on some questions that they'd like to ask you. We picked our top three uh, most unique questions. Um, and I figured these would be kind of interesting because I'm sure no one's ever asked you this. All right. Um, so the first one that I'll ask is relative to the current times, and it's rel relating to toilet paper. <laughs> uh, so apparently, Instagram is dying to know if you're a TP over or under kind of guy. Oh boy, you you only go under. So okay, so I said under two, and when I when I was talking to uh, Eric uh, from here, oh, I'm sorry, no, 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 uh, sorry. I think of the wrong question. Yeah, over. Okay. Bad. Over. Yeah. Like, if, you have, have, if you have pets, though, if you have pets, though, under is acceptable. What? What's the? What's the pets? Because it's easier it's for be pets to plod and be cats cats it. It. That's the only acceptable excuse. I'm with well, Kyle. I'm, I'm an over. You got to go over. Otherwise, like anytime we come to the shop, like. There's that. There's like two different roles in each stall, and like one will be over and one will be <laughs> under. It's like it's on purpose almost. And I'm gonna go for the always gone more. So I, this might be too much information, but I've always found it easier to do the one-handed rip when it's under. Otherwise, I feel like I rip a million roll sheets out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. you don't have good self-control. Apparently, yeah. not. stronger wrists, Charlie. Stronger wrists. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, so the next one is, uh, pretty controversial, controversial as well. And this is, is a hot dog considered a sandwich? Why or why not? Now, I mm. think that before you answer, I should read you the definition of a sandwich. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I want it without the definition. All right. Like maybe the definition after. Uh, All right. Mm. Oh boy. We brought the heat with the question. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you'd consider a fried Oreo a sandwich, too. Maybe. But it, an Oreo a sandwich? What about a burger? Uh, well, a burger is definitely a sandwich. Yeah. Unless you're in Australia, they don't call them sandwiches. They probably I, don't, call them I wouldn't call a burger a sandwich anyway, but I consider it a sandwich. Uh, See, I, I, would, I would never call a corn dog a sandwich. So, so the definition of a sandwich is an item of food consisting of two pieces of bread with meat, cheese, or other filling between them eaten as a light meal. So it's only one piece of bread. It's not really bread. So I guess if a hot dog <laughs> could join in the middle still, it's probably not a sandwich because it's one piece of bread. So is that like an open face sandwich then? I don't like, know. There's just so many details here that we don't know to answer the question, honestly. <laughs> See, I was gonna go with no because you because you don't eat it sideways. You eat it with the hot dog facing up, so like you just don't eat it the same way. Yeah, I'm sure there's some weird people out there that take a bite out of the middle of a corn dog, but not me. Oh, That's like people who take a bite out of the middle of a burrito. Mm -hmm. 
you know, ironically enough, we've had a lot of these discussions on long road trips with 1320 video. I, I'm trying to remember some of the crazy ones that we've done. One of them was when you put your shoes on, do you do sock, sock, shoe, shoe, or do you do sock, shoe, sock, shoe? Usually when I have to put my shoes on, I've already got my socks on. Yeah, I do too. But. Yeah, so like, my socks go on like right away, and then I'm in slippers for a while, and then shoes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if I'm doing good slippers, I think I do sock, slipper, sock, slipper. <laughs> yeah. See, there's some, you never know. And you don't get your socks dirty with any floor stuff. I wish, I wish Fred was here to feed us some more of those weird questions we had, because I think it was Fred and Dominic that was our photographer at the time that came up with some weird ass questions. <laughs> <laughs> Another one was what's the what's the wildest Wi-Fi name you've ever seen? Oh boy! Well, the up until a few weeks ago when I changed my router, my uh, my Wi-Fi name was Casting Couch. So okay. I think that was my favorite. Um, my <laughs> I can't think of any that I've seen, but I've seen plenty of funny ones. There's all the like FBI surveillance van that's not very original. Yeah. But uh, my my roommate, when I first started doing videos, the guy actually lived at his house for a few years. Um, our, we hated our neighbors and they were like 350, 400 pounds. And he set his Wi-Fi name to get a treadmill, you effing fatties. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people who've had some like pretty embarrassing passwords and like when they had to share them with other people, I've been in the room and it was like, yeah, let's hope nobody really important ever needs that password. Yep. Yeah, my 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 bookkeeping lady that I had to give a password to a couple weeks ago, she's like, wow, that is the most impressive cuss word password I've gotten so far. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Tell her she should be happy it's not password. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I had to change all my passwords when I uh, had my stuff stolen in London last year. So there's some pretty aggressive ones out there right now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Um, gosh, and now I had this other one that I didn't write down that I thought was pretty standard. Oh, it was pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Oh, yeah. I love Hawaiian pizza. See, I don't like it when it's – so Hawaiian pizza typically comes with the Canadian bacon, right? Yeah. So I don't – I've had – I've ordered pineapple pizza and just literally gotten pineapple on pizza, nothing else. And it wasn't the same. So because you did boring. you mean to do that, or you you assumed it was going to come with Canadian bacon? I think it was probably user error where I just okay. asked for pineapple pizza, and they gave me exactly what I asked for. But yeah, you're uh, gonna have some meat in there. Yeah, it's too too off putting without it. Um, uh, if you go to if you go to Brazil, they love their f like fruit and candy type pizzas. I haven't had one with just pineapple, but like cherries and stuff like that. They're yeah, they have some pretty crazy dessert pizzas. I've never even heard of that. Cherries on a pizza? Oh, yeah. If good? anybody's on from Nebraska, Da Vinci's usually had, I think it's cherry that they put on one of their, they have like a blueberry pizza. It's like a dessert pizza, so it's got like frosting instead of like, huh. you know, regular pizza toppings and stuff. Yeah, it looks like we got one guy from Nebraska. Dennis shouted out Omaha. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh then we also looks like we got the guys at Drive Cartel on here. There, do you know them? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm trying to place other Minnesota peoples. You probably would have met them at like Proving Grounds, maybe. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. They handle all of the car show and everything up there. That... Yep, that's why because our booth is pretty close to where they were at. The, yep. The car yep. show behind it. Uh, then these other ones were pretty standard, but I thought they were pretty good. Import or domestic? Yeah. Uh, Corvette guy. I'm a domestic guy. I love pretty much any cars. Some people think that I hate imports or I hate Fords or whatever, but I like anything unique and cool. But I'm a Corvette guy. Over the years, I'm sure you've seen some unique builds. What was the one that stood out to you the most that you still can't? Oh. Um, wow. <laughs> um, well, that's a that's a tough question to not think about. But two that stand out right away are both all the well, the twin engine Volkswagen from Colorado, the, the green one, that's one of the coolest cars of all time for me. And then there is a all-wheel drive 68 Camaro from 
somewhere in Europe, Norway, or I forget. I think they're from Norway, but they were in, in England when I was there for, at Santa Pod. And that was, that was my favorite car from last year was that Camaro for sure. When he pulled up to the line and did a burnout, all wheel drive, but it was, and then he ran like a 780 or something like that. That's yeah. yeah. You didn't expect the, all the wheels to be spinning. No. And they had a, they have a few, they have like three different all wheel drive. They have a, like a six or a seventies Corvette. And then they had, a, I forget what their other car was, but they had three different cars that were all wheel drive because they race on airport runways in Norway and they don't have any drag strips. Oh. So traction is not good out there. Most of the European countries, they race on runways, especially yep. Sweden. Um, Sweden's got Tirp. It's a really nice track, but they have a lot of airport runways and closed roads that they use. Yeah, that makes sense. Next one was, have you seen Leroy run sevens yet? No, I have. Uh, I've seen it run so many times; it's so hard to remember. Right. Because I'm trying to. The last time I saw him, I saw him at World Cup. No, I wasn't at World Cup finals this year. Um, I don't think I have. Because I, they were. Uh, I think there was one time this year when I saw it. Or maybe it was at the end of last year, but I don't think it ran a seven. Yeah, we did get a bunch of people asking about uh, whether or not you've been out to the Freedom Factory. Yeah, of course. I have, I have been there. I was there like a, like three or four days. We literally flew to Florida the day that he put up the video announcing that he, he bought the track. When he started teasing that there was some big announcement coming like two or three days before that, Oh my God, my, my Facebook messages, my text messages, like, oh my God, is he selling out to Motor Trend? Oh my God, is he closing the channel? I'm like, ah, I can't say anything. <laughs> but we got to check it out like literally a couple of days after that. So we got to see it before he had made any of the improvements. So I can't wait to see what it looks like next time we go down there. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. I wish I would have been able to go to the Freedom 500. We literally we had a a big street race that same weekend that was scheduled to happen the same day that uh, the Freedom 500 was. So I told him I couldn't make it. <clears throat> a lot of people were asking why I wasn't there. And that was the reason. And then when they rescheduled it last minute to Thursday, then I could have made it. So like I found out about the rescheduled Wednesday night at like six or 7 PM. I'm like, I could make it, but I really don't want to fly right now with all this stuff going on. Like, an airplane and an airport is the last place I want to be. It was so tempting to just fly down there and go race, but I, it was so much fun to watch that live feed. If you guys haven't seen the live feed from the Freedom 500, he just put on his YouTube channel, I think yesterday or two days ago. Yeah. And it was the perfect, uh, is this PG 13 feed? <laughs> it, was, it was the perfect shit show for what, how it should have gone down. Like literally, drag racers racing in a, a circle track with <laughs> live feed company publishing live feed that has only filmed drag racing to my knowledge uh, for their live feed. So it was like as a producer and as someone who's done live feeds and seen the, the full production live feeds uh, at the drag strips, it was just like, you could see that they were learning as they were going, but yeah. um, like to a normal viewer, it'd be really painful to me. It was entertaining because it was like, this is exactly how it's supposed to go especially right. when you have to reschedule the event two days earlier than you were planning 24 hours ahead of, ahead of time and have all your friends there. And um, it was just, I loved it. It was perfect. <laughs> I've seen some crazy uh, different like live stream stuff from different tracks. I didn't know this, but I, I guess they can put like first person cameras on different like little drones now and they can live stream from those. Mm -hmm. And I guess like, equipment that's required to be able to live stream from like a first person view drone is like 10 grand just to oh get it. Gosh, go oh, it's crazy. Uh, I don't know how, like if you guys pay attention to like the drifting stuff, but when FD started doing the live feed from the drones, like the amount of money that they invested into that was wild just to, and like it was garbage, but like it was still so fun to watch. And like now it's progressed so much that it's, I mean, it's like NFL football at this point, right. like the production quality of some of this stuff is wild. It's, it's probably gotten a lot cheaper since they did it there and, and a lot better. It's, you pay a big price to be like the innovators with that stuff. 
Oh yeah. It's like when you fir the first live streaming started coming out, it was like you had to buy eight hundred dollar software and the switcher and all this stuff. And now you can literally do it in your phone and add different angles and you got like yep. a full full production suite on your laptop or your phone. Yeah. A lot yeah, of that's why we don't do live feeds. And if you ever watch a live feed company at a drag strip, um, you'll understand why. I'm just gonna leave it at that because it's not easy. I, I give drag zine and uh, speed speed video a lot of credit for what they do because like signal cutting in and out, wires getting wet or tripped over by people, or like it's just once you start that live stream and you have three thousand people on, they expect you to keep that live stream going. And it's oh yeah, stressful. It, like, like the, why aren't they racing? Well, I can't just hit a button and make them go down the track. There's oil in the middle of the lane. Oh yeah, <laughs> it, people are needy when it comes to that stuff. Which is like yeah. it's, it's kind of it's like I do get it in one sense, and like as you see some of these uh, companies start to like charge for it, like subscription based. I'm sure we'll see that get even. I'm curious if that'll make it like people more picky. Or if it will weed out the people that care less and get the people that understand more. I'm curious to see if it goes either of those directions. Yeah. I think it'll be a wash because I would expect more if it's paid. Yeah, I agree. You will, you will get rid of some of the people that just won't pay for it because they're cheap. Yep. And those are the people that complain, complain the loudest anyway. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about some of those services like going to paid? I like it because... I prefer to see people at the track anyway. And so one of the down, like I've talked, I'm close friends with so many event promoters. I'm an event promoter yep. myself. <clears throat> and there's always been this concern that live feeds are going to hurt attendance at races. Yep. And it has, there's no way to prove it, but um, you know, it, it definitely hurts it. Like some people just don't want to go out in hundred degree weather to watch drag racing. Yep. I get that. I don't either. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I don't know. I think it's going to help find the right balance there. That makes sense. And like for, for me, like industry wise, like I can't go to every event like I, as much as I want to. And it's nice to be able to keep up on that stuff and like even see some of our sponsored racers and a lot of stuff and like see people and keep up with things that otherwise I'd have to be traveling every single weekend. It just doesn't make sense. So it's really cool to have access to people that care enough. I think the paying is going to be nice because I think it gives them access to hopefully more tools by actually bringing in money to improve the feed and everything. So I think it should be pretty interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see how like the next five to 10 years even uh, kind of changes the landscape of race events. Oh yeah, for sure. It's going to be, especially with public health and safety being a big concern. Um, right. You know, we, we know that things are going to start going back to normal in the next few weeks in different states. But what is, like, what is that? Um, I don't know, like the soft opening look like for drag races. It's right. Like I, like even myself, that's not the place that I'm gonna be like. Okay, we're back to normal. Let's go hang out with three thousand people at the track. Right. Yeah, it's all country is first priority. But especially when, I mean, it's it's not like you're going to a a formal formal dinner or something where everyone's at a certain uh, class of people, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> you yeah. get a, mix, a mixture of a little bit of everybody at those races and people aren't that uh, health conscious. So I don't know. Like, I, I want to be positive about it, but I, I think it's going to be a, a rebuilding phase for events for a couple of months. Hopefully not. Yeah. They just get yeah. It'll definitely I be agree on that one. I think it's going to be a, a mixture of just people wanting just drivers so that they can focus on that and not have to worry about other stuff. And yeah, that's the good thing is racers will be less concerned with it. And really that's the main concern is just getting back to racing. Um, yeah. A lot of events though, they can't exist without the spectators. A lot right. of them have payouts based yep. on people sitting in the seats and yep. we, you know, we bring our merchandise booth to events to help pay for what we do. Yep. So that's, a concern of mine it's just but at a minimum we just want to see racing again it's and i mean it's it, i mean you touched on the merch stuff i mean even for you guys in situations like this and we kind of touched off of it off camera like for you and and a lot of other people that make their livelihood off of traveling to events right now is just it's a dry spell so like yeah it's up to the community to support you guys support other people i mean we're lucky enough to be open and operational and helping customers but 
there's a lot of people that do a lot of different stuff in in our community that don't have that ability and it's kind of our, our time now to shine to buy that sweatshirt you've been thinking about buying buy those subscriptions and oh, yeah. spend that money to kind of just keep people going and we, we've been pleasantly surprised with the number of people that have moved to buying stuff on our online store and we really appreciate it because we literally have uh 10 paychecks to pay every two weeks just yeah. like a lot of small businesses out there they've had to lay people off um you know it helps us to stay to keep all i don't want to have to lay off any of my friends and we're in good shape right now and i, I love that we've got the fan base to support us to keep keep all of our employees in place and and keep bringing the content to you guys um and by the way while we're talking about merchandise i'm wearing our COVID 19 shirt shameless plug here this is okay, what he beat me with a shameless plug that's what the back of it looks like it says uh COVID 19 can shut down the tracks but it can't shut down the streets um yeah. And if, if you got one of these and you don't know it yet, if you go into your bathroom, shut the lights off, it glows in the dark on both sides. So I was pretty excited about that. No, that's super cool. I'm going to, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll find a link to that shirt and I'll be dropping it in the comments. Yeah. We got a little bit of hate about taking advantage of a pandemic, but you know what? It's going to cost us way more money than the shirt's ever going to make us. We're just trying to keep paying people and, and add a little humor to it. And it seems like the racer communities enjoyed it because plenty of people are street racing still. Um, and I, I think that's, that, that's the point is like, it, I don't think it's taking advantage. I think it's using your skills, abilities, your people, your network to make sure that your company stays alive in times like this and stays in front of customers and is offering something that people can give you money for. Help yeah. you guys go up and get something in exchange. So. I think that it's, is it's kind of fun to put light to a crappy situation to remember yeah, exactly. in the future. <laughs> yeah, so I want to take a chance to uh, acknowledge some of the questions we've been getting here in the comments. Yeah. Uh, they're still not showing up on our on our app, but I'm just going to scroll through here and find some. Sure. Uh, Glenn, who's also an Omaha, Nebraskan, is that what you call it? A Nebraskan? Yeah, Nebraskan. Nebraskan. Right. Uh, Glenn wants to know what's the sketchiest ride you've ever been on. Okay. Um, that's an easy one. Uh, in 2013, TX2K, uh, one of our, well, our biggest event for the year as far as like filming and merch sales and all that, like it's literally the biggest event of the year. Ironically enough, that's when they shut down all the tracks was right in the middle of TX2K this year. <clears throat> but 2013, um, I was in a Toyota Supra, and it, it's a car from Oklahoma. And one of the struggles with what we do at TX2K or on the Texas streets, it's not associated with TX2K, but the roll racing that happens there, one of the stressful parts about our job is finding cars to hop in that we can film from um, that are safe, don't have a passenger in them already. Uh, and sometimes we just like when we're not able to find enough content and find enough cars to ride in, we get the, the line of safety and like recklessness. It starts blurring a little bit and right. just kind of forget about some of the basics. But uh, I was usually the first two or three days of TX2K when we're going out roll racing at night. It's, it's just a dry spell. It's like people are sketched out about going out or the weather's weird or things just aren't organized. And so um, it actually rained the third day. So it was just like we had one day to get a lot of content. And so I was just desperate to get into any car I could. And we literally rolled up right before this group was going out at a gas station. And there was a Supra that was like 1400 horsepower. And he was racing my friend with his 1200 horsepower, 1300 horsepower C5 Corvette uh, turbo car. And I, didn't have a chance to talk to him at all. My friends are just like, here's a car you can hop in. I hop in the passenger seat, introduce myself to the guy. And this happens quite, quite often. Like never met the person at all, hop in their car, introduce myself and then go for a ride to 180 miles an hour. Um, which is kind of funny to put it that way, but right. So we raced four or five times. Um, and it was just such a dead even race. It was like back and forth, just fenders back and forth each time. The Super would win, the Corvette would win. Uh, and then the very last one, um, I don't know what happened, but I'm a, I'm a, it's not going to come through very well. You can look up, I think it's Texas Streets, uh, I think The Hunt, 
or maybe Texas Streets just without a name on it. The DVD trailer you can find on YouTube. It's at the very end of this. It cuts out when it happens. But um, we're going to the wall right here. Oh, dang. So that's the airbag. Um, and, and luckily we... We it was like the Jersey barriers are I found that's that's when I found out why Jersey bar barriers are built the way they are like they're they have like a a little like incline and then they're flat and I found out why because you, we hit the car like this and it went up the barrier and then back down so it wasn't like a direct hit luckily and that little part at the bottom like pushed us up so it didn't really hurt as much but I've got a little bit of a fracture in my leg and uh, so we hit that at about 100 miles an hour and that's that's definitely the sketchiest ride I've ever been in. Cause I like literally at that point, the things that went through my head were, this is going to be really hard to stay to the camera. So I'm like, I know I'm going to hit, but I'm, I'm worried about getting the video. So I just yeah. like, and then I, I hit and I was like, you know, I might die. That was like the next thing that went through my head. Right. And then right after that, I was like, huh, that wasn't bad. <laughs> I die. Yeah. And then I got out of the car. And I'm like, Oh, all right. Well, yeah. Here's that. And then someone ran up, to help out um actually my friend kong who's also from oklahoma that knew the guy that i wrecked with he ran up and he's he's uh he just ran up and was like took control of the situation is like go sit down let me grab your camera and i'm like okay no i want my camera like i'm not done filming it <laughs> We're still going. it was just such a weird situation but that was the sketchiest moment i've, I've had for sure it's amazing that you actually kept the camera looking forward you see a lot of those like accidents where i mean Rightfully so, people like drop the camera. Yeah, yeah. I mean, accidents. You I'm trying to film that. like other people walking that can't film it. Like, oh yeah, that's just impressive. There, there I, I forget. Like one of the first wrecks I ever filmed, I reacted like, "Oh my god!" And then after that, it was like, "Okay, I can't do that because I ruined the video." So right. you just you force yourself to be numb to anything that happens for the most part. Yeah, and it, it's, too. it is dangerous, but um, like when we're standing on the side of the track the split second decisions to flip out of that mode aren't really easy to make sometimes like cars doing wheelies right right. next to your head. You don't know if they're coming towards the wall or going straight. You, like they could hit you in the head with their bumper. Right. Um, Being in the car. I mean, I wonder like as a person who's unfortunately crashed more often than I should have, it's <laughs> like, and usually in the passenger seat, like the ability to probably focus on your camera probably helps. Cause you're not like, you're not tensing up from the crash. Like, you're not like yeah. bracing yourself. Like that was the exactly. first thing you ever taught me was that like, if you're going to hit something, pull your legs off the floor and put your, let go of the steering wheel or just not hold it and just like relax as best you can. And yeah, you just, you won't, you'll break less stuff usually. So I think that's a, that's probably, it's probably a good skill to kind of like have that focus on the camera. Cause it just kind of mm -hmm. keeps you off of thinking of crashing. And I've heard a lot of race car drivers that break their wrists because they're grip, gripping the steering wheel so much and it yep. grabs it and you don't want to, you want to hold on to it, but you can't. Yep. Th thumbs and wrists are like one of the most thumbs, wrists. And then like, I, we're seeing it now more as like people add cages, but like the anti-intrusion bars, like the lower parts of your legs and ankles, like just get bent up. Like, yeah, it's, uh, you know, cause you're going to, you, your instinct is to like brace yourself and kind of hold on when that's actually like the worst possible thing that you could do. Um, Charlie, it looks like we got Cletus in here talking shit. So, uh -oh. Uh -oh. comments here. Uh oh, I can't see it here in the comments yet for me. But uh, <laughs> what did he say? Let's find it. it. It hid from me for a second there. Uh, how do you get to see all the comments? Because it like only shows five of them. So I pulled it up. Uh -oh. so it was awesome. playing the live feed also on. Uh -oh. Yeah, I've got it out open on my phone too, but I can't see his. Uh, I can't see what he said. Uh, it looks like we did get a couple other questions. I want to make sure we get to really quick. Okay. Uh, Ryan Rich was asking if he can see the unicorn race Cletus's C seven. So since we got him in here. Oh, interesting. That would be a fun race. Uh, well, not right now. I think he's got <clears throat> to fix up something with it, but. That, I don't know, from a roll, that'd be interesting, because I can't get the, can't manage to get the unicorn to hook up from a roll. He's down quite a bit of power compared to that. It, it was funny, when he built Ruby, like, that car was pretty close to my ETs, but then they got it sorted out, and it's way beyond <clears throat> anything.
and Leroy has turned into so much more of a race car from the point that we raced three years ago to now. Um, I've, I've stuck with trying to keep my car the way I built it. And uh, as much as fun as it'd be to race sevens in a stick shift car, like I mentioned earlier on the live feed, I'm not a mechanic, <laughs> but that'd be, that'd be fun to do. I would love to race them again with, with the C, the C5 with something. Yeah, we'll have to see that one. Uh, we you, had, yeah, Cleta said that white ZR1 is slow. Beat it many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would love I would love to see video of that. Yeah, yeah. That's actually gonna... how the whole uh, the whole Leroy and Unicorn uh, battle started. Was um, he had his C7, and we raced oh, like five six years ago on the highway, and. Uh, we wanted a rematch, so like we, I, I called him out for rematch, and then I announced I was going to build a car, and then he's like, "Well, shoot, I got to build a car too." So that's how both the C5s came about, which is like that was just the beginning of him blowing up, and I'm so proud of him. It's it's been awesome to see it evolve from there. He's yeah. done some huge things. Yeah, definitely, and we're all we all follow all of that at at Map. We watch all those videos, so. Um, Quitus, if you're still watching, we all we are all super into it. So, oh yeah, he said we get a hell yeah, brother. Uh, hell yeah, brother. Hey, Before you ask another hey. question, I, I just I, I forgot about this. This is how I met the map guys, the enemy performance guys. Oh, little turbo clocks. This is one of the original turbo clocks. Uh, so when when Dan and the guys put one of these up like four or five years ago. I shared it on our Facebook and they sold out like instantly. <laughs> and that's when he's like, oh, maybe we should do some marketing with these guys. So it's been a, it's been a really fun relationship with you guys since then. I really appreciate all the support. The, the turbo clocks are such like a, such a cool thing. And like most people don't realize that like they're from our original turbo program. Like we used to make turbos. So all those were the, when we finally decided that wasn't something we were going to do anymore, we had like a, I mean, it was literally a pallet, if not even two pallets, filled with housings. And we're like, what are we going to do with these? And, like, our CNC guy at the time was like, I could put a clock in it. Okay, that sounds good. Like, you can run with that. <laughs> Didn't make any money on them. I think you technically paid customers to buy them, but it was good marketing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we're like, I think we came up with the price. like, that, that's stupid. Make it cheaper. Just like. Nah, I don't. Mine's got the little engraving on here. Yeah, so yours is yours is the coolest one. That's right, and it has four or four or five years of dust on it too. It's it's been on my desk since I since I got it. I mean, the fact yeah. that you still have it proves though that it was it was a smart move. Because oh yeah, like, it's, that's one of the coolest things. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, when, we, when we all started to work from home, I did the same thing and sort of like clean off my desk and like grab things that I'm like, oh, I'm gonna bring this home, and like I just I touched my turbo clock and it was just so much dust. I was like, I'm not. I have to wipe this off real quick. Like this, this is oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I wanted to throw this one out here uh, from Jean Dickinson. She said, uh, "You've grown so much, but do you sometimes miss the old days of Heidi Ho Productions when it was all just friends?" Oh boy, Jean is a guy, but he doesn't always identify as a guy. I think the um, picture of a girl on his Facebook. Yeah, he's got a picture on there. <laughs> That's the, the, the reason he's asking that is because I've known Gene Gino is what he goes went by goes by uh, since I started filming street racing um, probably a year or two after our, my first few street races and he was uh, he had a Mustang here in Omaha that um, that would race Parrish in his blue turbo truck which was one of the very first viral videos I ever had but I definitely miss those days like back when. Like if you if you find any of the videos from 06, 07, it's like nine and 10, 10 second street cars. That was like the title of the video was like nine second street cars. Cause like, holy crap, there's nine second cars racing on the street. This is, this is just insane. And now we filmed street outlaws that are racing, you know, they've got seven second quarter mile cars and a run quarter mile, but some of them run threes in the eighth mile and race them on the street. And that's that's um i mean it's like 12 13 years ago but that's not that long a time <laughs> yeah I do, I do miss those days though and heidi ho i don't know if anybody on here knows this except for gino but heidi ho productions was my company name 
uh, for like a year or two. And then right after I had my first viral video that had Mr. Hanky and Heidi Ho Productions on it, I was like, you know, this video got like a half million downloads. I probably shouldn't have a piece of poop on it. <laughs> and so that's when I decided to rename my company, uh, which was actually named by another one of my friends. We, we had our message board, uh, Omaha Racing message board, and I put up on there, I think it was a contest. I don't know if I gave away a shirt. I don't forget what it was. But basically I said, what should I name my company? And uh, my friend Parker actually said 1320 video. I'm like, just some random numbers? Yeah. He said, no, that's the amount of feet and a quarter mile. I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. Okay. I right. like that. And now I want to know how many people listening didn't know that that's how many feet are in a quarter mile. Because we just had that with Charlie before the video started. He was like, I just learned that. Yep. Yeah. So I want I want people to comment if they didn't know that. Because I'm real curious to hear if that's something that, like, is that common knowledge? Is it not? Like, I can guarantee you it's not because we put an Instagram post up, like, a year or two ago. And it was, you know, the the concert photo, like, in the dance floor, the guy's got the confused face, like, like yep. looking up, yeah. it said yeah. the moment you realize 1320 is the amount of feet and a quarter mile, and it has like I think it was our third or fourth most liked post that year because so many people <laughs> had no idea. When I first started putting stickers on my car, the guy at the time slip booth asked me what 1320 meant on my car after he handed me a time slip that had 1320 on it. <laughs> so it's just people don't really think of it. <laughs> curious if you'll have any input on this or not but it goes not really a racing question but opinions on h2i h2oi and if changing the car culture controversy surrounded by that kind of event is ever gonna happen oh boy you know it's we've we've filmed and been to and enjoyed so many events like h2o that and i don't know specifically what his question is asking but i can only assume that he means like the city shutting down of that because it gets too rowdy type of a thing. And we've yep. been to so many events like that. Um, I'm sure like proving grounds has had different progressions of rules in place. Yep. People don't die and the track and the event doesn't get sued. And when you have these car culture events that happen on the street that where there's not necessarily like there is a group that organizes it, but there isn't like an official event necessarily. Yep. We like Americruise and Lincoln is one example. There was like there's a car show called Americruise, and then what happens after Americruise is completely different. Same thing with TX2K, like everything yep. off of the street racing on the streets, and it just gets too big. And like it's disappointing, but I also feel responsible at the same time because when we go to these events, we go and publicize how crazy this is, and then next year twice as many people show up, and that's partially the media is doing and partially just the way it's gonna progress. But those are the events I love. It just sucks when they get so big that yeah. the general public can't put up with it. They don't have they don't have any other choice but to shut things down when yeah. when things are too crazy. The the level of the level of like um, scrutiny that the police have during that event is extremely disappointing. Um, it's it yeah. feels like being in Australia. Uh, the the event I went to in Australia last in Perth, they have a half mile event that's three hours outside of Perth in this tiny like I don't know, 60 or 70 thousand person town on the coast and it's nice because all the car enthusiasts get to escape the big city where the cops don't let you drive anything on the street that's modified but what happened that weekend when i was there was they sent like five traffic enforcement police three hours outside of town to the city and they basically put a like they flagged all of the cars that they could so they couldn't be driven on the street anymore um, just because they had like windshield banners or their car was too low yeah. and it's, it just, it sucks because it makes it so unenjoyable for car enthusiasts, but I don't know. It's, it's tough to find the right balance between being responsible and having the event and uh, doing the right thing. You want to show all the cool stuff, but then by showing it, you're showing people that exist and now it's going to yeah. be bigger. And that's one of the things that keeps me going. I like, it really motivates me when I, it's hard to get excited about cars anymore. Um, I, I learned this term jaded from uh, David Freiberger a long time ago. Yeah. I was like, what does jaded mean? And it's like, basically you around the stuff so much that it just doesn't like excite you anymore. Yep. 
when I find a car where I'm like, wow, like the twin engine Volkswagen or the all wheel drive Camaro in, in England. Yep. Like I, I can't stop taking pictures and videos of the car. Literally my, like the crew that's with me, I'll be like, we have to go. Okay. I'm like, <laughs> fine. It's the same with events where they're smaller grassroots events. Those are the events that I love, like yep. going to power, uh, proving grounds. That was so much fun. Like it wasn't serious racing. Um, some of it was, but it was just like that environment that I liked. I went to the shootout two years ago and about five or six years too late to really enjoy that event. But the same yeah. thing happened there where um, I think someone got hurt or a couple of people got hurt one year and they just locked down the rules so that it didn't happen again. Yep. It's just, it's just the progression for events. That's, that's the way it goes. And there's just a cycle, like another event will pop up. They'll have the same thing. You just got to look for that, that, the next yeah, thing. Yeah, kind of keep your eyes peeled. And that, that totally makes sense. We kind of, I think Char Charlie's kind of new with us, so I, I don't think he's hit that point yet, but we were talking about it on one of our last live feeds, how it's like, you know, the first day of working at a place like MAP, you kind of like the dino's running and like you're excited and you're pumped and you're like, you spend your lunch break watching it and like, this is the coolest thing that's ever happened. And then like now I'm 12, 13 years in of doing this at a couple different shops and like, the dyno is just like annoying. Like I'm like, I'm on a phone call. Like this is just horrible. Like, can we make that car a little bit quieter right now? Like this is just, <laughs> you kind of just get over it. And then we, you know, we keep figuring, we keep hiring new employees or you know, somebody shows up and we get to give a tour and like their eyes light up as we get close to it. And it's like the coolest thing ever. And you kind of get to have that, like, for me at least I get to like re-experience stuff again. And I'm like, all right, I, like this is fun. This is like, this is so outside of the normal. This is my day job. And it's like, like things become underwhelming. Like if a car doesn't make a thousand horsepower on the dyno, like it's kind of like, eh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. agree. There was, there was someone on the live feed that asked a question, Mo Akramau, he said, it'd be my dream to shoot for 1320 video. And it, that reminded me of him because he's shot for us a few times. I flew him to TX2K uh, last month to yep. shoot for us. Um, but like watching his energy and his facial expressions when things happen, I'm like, yeah, like I remember that moment. Yeah, years ago when I saw my first, well, actually like six years ago when I saw my first 2000 horsepower GTR, Yep. you know, do a burnout on the two step and just shakes the ground. You're like, it's just normal now, but yeah, it is really cool. Just not as cool anymore. <laughs> and I think it, it helps, for, for me, it helps recently, the last couple of years, at least the rapid progression of cars, like the rapid yeah. progression of technology and the stuff that like, if I skip one year of going out to like World Cup finals, the next year I'm back, like everything is different. Like yeah, the cars are like a second faster. Yeah. And it's just like it's it's a good way to get re-energized. And like I like PRI and places like that have always been it for me, where like I need that kind of like once a year reset of like it just it kind of makes makes you remember why you do all of it. Mm -hmm. We just had another good question. What's the coolest shop you've ever visited? Oh boy. It's really hard to rewind my brain into all the shops I've been to. Um, <laughs> one of the, one of the most impressive shops I was ever at was uh pack performance in Sydney because like here in the States, our shops are, well, I guess there are some in, in Australia that are similar, but a lot of the shops that I go to are just dirty, unorganized. They've got like oil changes on one rack and they're doing twin turbos on another. And there are shops that specialize in things now, that, but yeah. like in Sydney, there's, it, it's been like that. It seems like longer where shops are more specialized in one platform and you just see the, the top of the top builds on yep. each rack that they have there. They're working on. And there's like, there's underground racing here. There's um, Calvo that like the last few years, well, the underground's been doing it for a long time, but the last few years, a lot of shops have started specializing T1 yep. the yards, but at pack you walk in and it's, they don't just do turbos. They don't just do wheels. They don't just do paint jobs on the, it's like every car they do is a show car with a triple rotor, um, rotor engine in it. And, or, you know, 13 B with 12, 12 horsepower. Um, right. it was just like, wow, they had everything they had there was nice. And it wasn't, we didn't arrange this. We just said, I called them like that day and said, Hey, can we stop by? And we walk in, and it's all like top level builds. It's not like they had all their customers bring a bunch of cars in for us. Yeah. That's just there. <laughs> it's just like every lift blows your mind just a little bit. Yeah. 
the engine bay was beautiful, shaved, painted, like all, all of the builds, nice, fully done interior. And that's, that's partially like a rotary thing. Like you see a lot of those, especially in Puerto Rico. Yep. They're show cars with a thousand horsepower. Um, but that was just, yeah, that was impressive. That makes sense. I would like to go to underground racing sometime. They're very, they don't necessarily like other media coming into their shop because they like to keep a real tight control on what yep. gets leaked out. But um, I'd love to stop by there sometime and just to see the mass amount yeah. of 2,000 horsepower Lambos they're building. Right. Yeah. Even even just like the small photos of the inside of that shop are just, uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a shop nerd myself too. Like it just, I, after working at this so long, like seeing clean, well-organized, like very well thought out processes and stuff are just, it, it's yeah. so interesting. It, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head with seeing like Calvo, T1, and those guys kind of follow those footsteps. Like, I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing that progression is like, as people nail down that focus on what they're doing, we just, mm -hmm. it, it just levels up immediately because that's all that they're focusing on. Oh, yeah. There were several shops in Australia. There was another, they did half rotaries and half other cars, but there was a shop that I just remembered that uh, it's called Rapasardo and they're not like a performance shop. They're a crane company. I don't know if they rent cranes or do the work themselves, but they own like the massive scale cranes, but they have a top fuel team with nine or 10 top fuel cars. Oh, wow. So we walked in there and they're like, oh, sorry, there's only six here today. I'm like, huh? You had six top fuel cars in one one shop? We're like, well, there's a second shop next door. I'm like, and they had a stack of billet top fuel <laughs> engines sitting there that were in various states of broken, like holes blasted through them and oh, wow. that they were planning on welding back together. <laughs> that was another impressive shot. Wow. The yeah, California drag racing stuff is wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't want to keep you much longer, Kyle, but I did have one final question for you. And it was kind of piggybacking off of something we talked about with uh, one of the questions about events um, and being shut down. And my question was with your uh, you know, like growing popularity, you know, a lot of people are starting to know you now um, and not just 1320. Yeah. Is it becoming difficult for you to go to events and get time to just enjoy it still or at this point is it like you're so inundated with like fans or whatever that it's impossible yeah um i seem to do a pretty good job of finding that balance when i'm on the track it's hard it, it's pretty easy just to focus on what we need to do <clears throat> but if i stop by our merchandise booth uh, especially like tx2k it's it's painful because i want to say hi and meet every single one of our fans Right, I'd love to do that, but <clears throat> like TX2K, some of the days there's 20,000 people there and there's 300 at our booth. And if I stop, if I go there, I'm literally stuck there for an hour. Um, so it's, it, it can be a little much sometimes um, when there's oil downs and stuff. I love just walking around the pits and, and meeting people in San Jai. Um, and, but yeah, it's, it's not necessarily the fans that make it, less enjoyable um right. it's just harder to do our job sometimes like when i'm in the middle of an interview and some kid runs up screaming because he just met me for the first time i'm like all right we just talked for like seven minutes with this guy i've got to start this over or f figure out where we where we got interrupted at um that's a little frustrating but for the most part everyone's respectable about that i, I love meeting our fans especially just to hear what our videos mean to them it, it's very motivating to me it's it's awesome to, to it, it's still surreal like I keep talking about Australia. That's one of my favorite places to go because the first time I went four or five years ago, I was at, we did a little night meet Sydney Dragway as like a meet and greet with Motive, uh, Motive Video, and they tripled their attendance for their test in two night. Um, and it was weird because I'd never been to Australia before, and everybody there knew my name on the other <laughs> side of the world. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? That's when it really hit me. It was... I don't know. It was, it was, it was really cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, it was really awesome having you on here. It was great getting to meet you a little more and, uh, Dalen, just nice to see you. Yeah. Thank Same. you. For yeah. No, Kyle, it was good to chat. I mean, like I said, I feel like we've crossed paths many times at events. It's nice to actually sit down and talk a little bit, even if for it's sure. on the internet thousands of miles away. Yeah. <laughs> And thank you to MA Performance for everything. They've been a sponsor of ours for three or four years now. And 
I really appreciate it. They help us to be able to do what we do. Yeah. Well, we like to support people who are doing it right. So, um, well, guys, thanks again for tuning in to everybody who made it on here. Uh, this will also get repurposed on some other platforms. So um, if you're watching this from the future, uh, thanks again. But uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, that's what we got for you guys. Uh, otherwise, stay safe. Um, yeah. Hopefully kind of see you guys at an event soon. Yeah, for sure. And there you have it, guys. Hopefully you learned something that you can either take with you into the garage or bring with you to the track. Tune in next week for another episode. We'll see you then. Is that good enough? Yeah. Okay.